Om Namo Shivaya, 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 Om Namo Shivaya. I bow to Shiva and God in you and in all things. And I pray that through these talks, I help to awaken a little bit of that consciousness that God resides in you. You are as great as the greatest master who ever lived. But don't go about preening yourself like that. Because what you have to do is wake up from your egoic delusion, your dream, and realize that you are that. Tatvamasi, thou art that. I would like to read in uh, my book, Conversations with Yogananda, a rather long passage today. I have been with him, that is to say, obviously my guru, about five months when he invited me to a meeting at which he instructed another of the monks, Harvey Allen, on his wishes for the work in India. The plan at that time was to send Harvey there. Harvey, unfortunately, though a good person and earnest, wasn't able to tune in to the Master's consciousness, and a year or two later, caught up in the opinionated attitudes that he held, his very earnestness became his undoing. Desires for the world did the rest. Anyway, the thought came to me as Master was speaking that that, uh, even though he had said nothing about sending me to India, my work might lie there some day. Indeed, I had an intuition that it was to lie there some day. I therefore took notes of everything he said. Here below is what I wrote. There should be a Bengali and later a Hindi correspondence course. The teachings, presumably the correspondence course lessons, should be a benefit of membership. A history of the work should be published in Bengali. A magazine should be in two languages, Bengali and English. In the beginning, it should comprise about 25 pages. At this point, I wrote down Revelations of Self-Realization. I am no longer clear as to what he meant here. Did he intend this as a name for the magazine, for the correspondence course lessons? In fact, I think it was for the correspondence course lessons. There should be monthly festivities, he continued, and once a year, a congress of all the centers. Winter is the best time in India to hold such a congress. January 2nd to 6th, more or less, would be a good time, lasting one week and ending on a Sunday. It would be good also to revive Sri Yukteswar's four annual festivals on the solstices and equinoxes. A teacher should be sent around to the centers on a regular basis as a means of keeping them bound together. Recorded talks should be sent out regularly to the centers. Keep the organizations in India and America united. A good way to do so would be to make them financially interdependent. I will return to this point at the end of this section. He then spoke of the larger picture, because in the divine plan... Materialism was intended to be manifested in the West and spirituality in the East. Krishna came first to teach the fundamental principles of spirituality. Later, Jesus Christ was sent to the West. The Eastern is the more ancient of the two civilizations. It was therefore right for the West's development to follow that of the East. Material realities come after the spiritual. The teachings which God is giving and sending now through this work provide a balance between East and West, between Eastern spirituality, that of India especially, and Western material efficiency, that of America in particular. Not long after that meeting, the Master, to whom my interest in India could not but be obvious, commented, I have plans for you, Walter, that's what he used to call me. He didn't say what they were, but I took him to mean that his thought was to send me, too, to India some day. I was delighted. Later on, however, I fell into a deep depression. 
Here I thought I've only just found my guru. He is my India. Oh, don't let me be sent away from him so soon. A day or two later, the certainty came to me that he would never ask anything of me that was not in my own highest interest. Thus, I fought my way out of this temporary mental morass. The next time I saw him, he gazed at me penetratingly and said, No more moods now, Walter. Otherwise, how will you be able to help people? From 1950 to 1952, he planned every year to go to India and to take me with him, along with several others. The trip never materialized in the end because he left his body. As things eventually worked out, my service to his work was destined to be elsewhere. Would it also later be in India? Only time will be, and in fact we see that it has been. Because my activity over the years has entailed creating a missionary work in America and Europe, the same question has arisen in my mind. How can two separate works be kept tied together, the branch to the parent body? I would have loved for my work to be tied also to Self-Realization Fellowship and Yogoda Satsanga, but that door so far remains closed. Ananda, therefore, is a separate organization from SRF, not by my will, and it is one with SRF in its dedication to serving the same guru. The Master had suggested that his works in India and America be made financially interdependent as a means of tying them together. Realistically, however, the financial flow was and would have to remain for many years entirely one-directional, from America to India, not the reverse. This situation is bound to change in time, but from my experience, I think the three best ways of keeping two separate works interdependent, this is my experience, and I'm adding it to what the Master said, one, have frequent interchange of personnel. Two, to arrange for frequent visits both ways by the leaders in the two works. And three, to include every leader in whatever deliberations concern the whole, the work as a whole. These are the practices we follow at Ananda. As a result, the financial flow also is becoming increasingly reciprocal. Now, this is something I've heard again and again from people. Some friend of mine was visiting me just recently, and he said that I've examined every ashram. As soon as the founder leaves his body, there's fighting. I have done my best to change that picture. I know there is a statistic in America that uh, organizations never succeed the death of the founder, at least in the same format. They always change to some extent. Some of them, however, have continued and vital and strong. I accept that an organization is what Emerson said, a lengthened shadow of one man. It cannot be otherwise. But I remember David Frawley, who is well known in India because he teaches Ayurveda and has written many books on astrology and many books of Indian culture and comes frequently to India. So it's two qu quotes of his I would like to repeat here. One was somebody asked him, what do you consider the best? You've seen all the ashrams and communities in America. Which one do you consider the best one? He said, Ananda, Ananda, and Ananda. And we pronounce it Ananda there. We don't say Anand because it's already enough to get Americans not to say Ananda, and Englishmen not to say Ananda. And so, praise God for small victories. At least they say Ananda. I know it's not quite right, but it's our pronunciation in America. It's the one I've settled on, and so we sort of call it that way here too. At any rate, he said that, and one time he said that uh, he visited us, and he said to one of our leaders there, he said, of all the ashrams that I know, only Ananda is likely to outlive the death of its founder. Why? Because he has delegated authority to other people. I think that is a very important thing, and many of you run organizations or have influence in different organizations. 
It's a very important thing not to have the thought that you've got to do it all. You cannot do it all. The only way you can do it all is to keep it minuscule. If you want it to grow, you've got to train people to, to uh, become leaders in your spirit. And once you go, they'll keep on. Now, I founded a large work in the West. About a thousand people live in our different Western communities. Thousands of peoples are connected with them. And we have seven communities in, your, in America and in Italy. Uh, they are wonderfully united, and the reason I've been free, I have felt free to come to India, has been that I have seen that the work there goes on well, and uh, the decisions that they make are the decisions I would make in prayer to my guru, because I never have come in and said, I want this or I want that, what he wants, but what is right. And I see that they have that attitude because this show will be seen by many of our members. I'm saying it to them particularly. Please, when I go, and I'm not young anymore, I could go any time. I hope to be able to live long enough in this body to get this work well established in India. But please remember that the first thing is harmony. That's what my guru used to say. But also, I have trained you in my will, and I would like to see that after I go, there not be that kind of thing. You can see that my guru was very interested in getting the work going in India, but he could never leave America because his, uh, he didn't have enough people there to... You see, he was breaking completely new ground. Americans had never heard of these truths. I, at least, came when he'd been in this, in this country since 1920, so when... I founded Ananda in 1968. There was already a backlog, you might say, of influence. And there was his book, which gave a great deal. And the fact that I had lived with him personally, received personal instructions from him. And he had actually put me in charge of the monks and uh, trained me in ways to take charge. Thus, uh, what I have done is not an opposition to them and not different from them. It is all trying to perpetuate the same uh, bhav, the same basic spirit. Now, he did send me here. He hinted to me many times that my work would be in India. This is just one little conversation with him. Um, he, he intended for me to go around India and giving lectures when we came here together. And uh, it is... I know it's my job, and how would it be an American's job? It's because we're not Americans. As I said a few days ago, we're not Americans. We're disciples of a great master, besides which I know I have been here many, many lives. It's in my blood. What we want, however, is to remember this business that I have seen in so many ashrams in India, too, Jockeying for power, jockeying for position, envy, jealousy. Oh, my God. What do you join a spiritual work for? To become egotistical? These big mahants sitting on the backs of elephants? Well, let them be on elephants, but let them not think that they, they belong on an elephant. We're so unimportant. I think that the more a sadhu develops spiritually, the less important he should think himself to be. The... the uh, Sadhus who are at conferences on the stage and somebody puts a mala around them and one gets a bigger mala than the other and the other one is uh, thinking, why did he get a bigger mala? He's not as important or more important than I am. This, Remember, this is not what sannyas is all about. You don't wear geru. You know, that's, that's nothing. Your heart is what God watches. You do this so people will understand that that's what you're looking for, but you've still got to look for it. Really to be deserving of wearing geru is to have reached that point, not where you're not attached to the world, but where you no longer are attached to your own ego, and that's the world. That's the essence of what we're all trying to get away from. We want to understand that he alone is the doer. And so what is this work and that work and the other work? It's all God. You know, one time in Delhi, many years ago, I was lecturing in 1961, and there was a 
good crowd of people before me. And somebody asked a question afterwards, uh, I, a kind of question that made me realize the best thing for him would be to have periods of like weekends or longer of retreat in a spiritual center. Well, there we were in Delhi, already developing a spiritual work. My natural inclination, and my guru bhais would have called it my duty, would have been to say, come to us. I didn't feel that. I felt he was a disciple, he, that his ray of attunement, you might say, was with Sri Aurobindo. So I said, well, there's a Sri Aurobindo ashram here in Delhi. I suggest you go to that. And he came to me later. He said, how do you know I go to that ashram? I said, I don't know. I just felt it. Well, I know that many people in my organization would have said, oh, you were treacherous. No, I don't feel it. My duty is not to the organization. My duty is to people who come to me as individuals and want my help. There was one man who came to me at the beginning of Ananda in 1969 or 70. I think it was 70. He said that uh, I have inherited $200,000 and I don't know whether I should join Ananda or I should go to India. Well, I thought I wasn't at all tempted by that $200,000, which we needed desperately. But I was thinking he would not have asked me that question if he had really been sure Ananda was for him. And I didn't feel Ananda was for him. So I meditated and I said, I think the only reason I asked him how much it was, was to feel whether he would have enough money to be able to live in India for a long time. And when he said, yes, I can... I have 200,000. I said, well, then I think you should go to India. There I was trying to start a work. I don't think sectarianly. I urge you not to. Remember, this whole show is God's. Just clap your hands at everything and say, well done, Lord. In India there lived by the banks of a stream A hermit whose prayers chose applause for their theme he gazed at the flowers and he smiled at the sun. Then he clapped with delight. Lord, he cried, oh, well done. Well done, Lord, oh, very well done. The mountains that laugh with the gypsy clouds, the fields smile to welcome the sun. All nature sings praises aloud. All nature sings praises aloud. The tree stands to show their elation. A day on God's earth has begun. And ever to heart in creation, in speechless wonder is bound. And ever to heart in creation, in speechless wonder is bound. Well done, Lord, oh, very well done. The joy that you've planted in children's hearts, the thrill known in bearing the sun, the hope when a trial departs. The thrill known in bearing a sun, the hope when a trial departs. The gladness of men in their name. Its victories won. Our joys are the proof of your labors. How wonderful, Lord, are your arts. Our joys are the proof of your labors. How wonderful, Lord, are your arts. Well done, Lord, oh, very well done. At last I discovered the mystic key. The world's joy, joy oh secretive one, replies to your sweetness in me. The world's joy, joy oh secretive one, replies to your sweetness in me. For here in my heart lies the answer, your love shedding light like the sun. All life seems to leap like a dancer. When gazing I see only thee All life seems to leap like a dancer When gazing I see
Zion. 